a little note. All right, so now we're ready to kick it off. Welcome again. Uh, this is our January webinar for the new Nurse to Nurse program. And for those of you that either heard about it through social media or through a flyer or through word of mouth, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so excited to have you joining us. Uh, we will be doing offering these webinars monthly and our program is geared specifically for our nurses, for all the nurses that are working day in and day out. Um, this program is built for you. We're gonna hear a lot more about um, all the different aspects of this program, but I just wanted to say welcome, welcome. And um, if anyone has any need for tech support, please go into the Zoom chat. My name is Ravi and I'm the host and just shoot me a message and I will definitely be able to work through anything that um, I can do to help support you. All right, so we are ready to keep going. I'd like to take this time to introduce Cherie Castellano. Cherie is our director of the Rutgers National Center for Peer Support. Um, she is responsible for so many different peer-to-peer um, -peer support lines that we have here at Rutgers UBHC um, that are actually acknowledged through um, best practices and um, actually nationwide. So uh, Cherie is gonna be taking over as the first part of this presentation. So Cherie, I hand over the program to you. Thank you so much, Ravi. And again, on behalf of the Nurse to Nurse team, we wanna start with a thank you for all you do. And we're really excited to be with you today and get started to offer you support as you care for everyone else. Um, my name is Cherie Castellano. I'm a licensed clinician. I'm the director of the National Center for Peer Support at UBHC here. And um, I'm gonna try to keep it moving forward uh, to talk about the program more than me, but I wanted to let you all know that I, I have a, a family of nurses and I'm very excited to be with you today. We also have Michelle Julian, one of our uh, clinicians who is also a resilience expert who will be speaking in a moment. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Barbara, our nurse to nurse peer counselor, who is one of our leads. Babs? Oh, you're on mute, love. I was just testing everyone. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Barbara Brilliantine. I go by Babs. Uh, I have been a nurse since birth. <laughs> Uh, but the actual amount of time is 24 years. And I specialized in maternal fetal health, uh, as well as working in a few arenas um, of, in psychology and in nursing leadership. Uh, I worked at a correctional center for a while, and um, I also taught for a little bit. Uh, why peer support? Uh, I'm here for... Um, one very good reason. It's because it's in our hearts to help the healers. And uh, we've walked in their shoes. We're in this together. Uh, and I also wanted to bring up a resiliency word. Uh, my resiliency word is perseverance. I think that all nurses, we have, uh, this is probably one of our daily tools that we use and we're very resilient people. And um, and I would now like to pass back to Cherie. Thanks Thank for coming, everyone. This is for you. Yes. Just Thank know you. that. Thank you so much, Bab. So, you know, in all of our work, we wish we could be in person, but we're managing the Zoom right now. Um, we need to hear from you. The program is for you and about you. We are who we serve in our peer support programs. So if you could just introduce yourself in the chat, let us know your name, the years you've been a nurse, if you don't mind adding your unit, and just one word that describes your resilience. That would really be helpful to have you participate with us today, because the more we understand you, the better we serve you. Next slide, Ravi. So what we have at Rutgers University Behavioral Healthcare is a national center for peer support. And it's based on a model that I'm just gonna talk about in a minute because you are the newest group added to the team. Um, we started over 20 years ago and I designed this model based on a program called Cop to Cop. The idea is that 
you know, there are some high risk populations that are really unique that although they could reach out to a psychologist or a therapist or their EAP, they're not going to because they only understand each other. Um, and so to, to sort of coin a term, we are trying to rescue rescuers in the peer support efforts. And so I designed Cop to Cop and it was successful. We used retired police officers to help other police officers manage stress with peer counseling over the phone and face-to-face. -face. And then 9-11 hit. And when 9-11 hit, we recognized that there's lots of kind of rescuers who needed our peer support model. So we created fire to fire, vet to vet, teacher to teacher. As more people stepped up to help and serve others, we created programs for them. What we found is that shared lived experience is very healing. Um, it's really the best way for groups to connect um, that are high risk and exposed to trauma like you are in nursing. Access is a focus, right? Since you all work 24 seven, so do we. We can't be press one if you're suicidal or press two if you're homicidal. We have to be live in 30 seconds with a nurse or a clinician available to you at the end of the 800 number. We have to be cultural and strength-based. I didn't invent peer support. I just took a twist on it. Peer support, people are familiar with the AA model where we say, hi, I'm John, I'm an alcoholic. And so are the people in the room. And we sort of connect and talk about our struggles. This is, hi, I'm John, I'm a nurse, or I'm Cherie and I'm a mom. Or So it's really for the specific groups and it's culturally and strength-based connection. We have peers and clinicians working together. So in every program, we have peers and a licensed clinician. After 20 years of peer support experience, we have 250 peers working. Um, we actually do prevention, intervention, and postvention. And we were identified as a national best practice by the American Psychiatric Association um, and the Department of Defense Center of Excellence. Because you're nurses with such a, a bright understanding of data and, and research, we did have our, our project um, evaluated at UNC Chapel Hill. And so our model was validated to improve quality of life. And now we've added wellness and virtual capacity. Next slide. All right, and before we go to the next slide, we have some great resiliency words. So Sheree, I wanted to share a few from the chat. We have empathy, uh, we have thriving and growing. Uh, we have patience, which is of course much needed in the work that all the nurses are doing. Uh, boundaries, love that. You definitely have to have boundaries. And of course, perseverance. So those are a few of the resiliency words and welcome to everyone that's been um, putting that into the chat. Uh, and we'll go to the next slide. Thank you. So I think what I wanted to make clear is we have so many programs in the National Center for Peer Support focused on first responders is you certainly are first responders that deserve this special kind of service just for you um, as we are who we serve and we are targeting, doing as much as we can to get help to you for all that you're doing. Next slide. I think, you know, sort of the introduction of this specific program is that it is funded um, it's Rutgers University Behavioral Healthcare, but it's funded by the New Jersey Nursing Initiative, as well as the Pandemic, Pandemic Relief Fund. Um, and so we're very grateful for the funding. But as a new pilot project, we really want to grow it and make it exactly what you need. Next slide. You know, this is a this is sort of the flyer we've been putting out there since we've gone live and are trying to get people to use the services. And this just tells you a little bit about who we are. And we'll send this out to you as a follow up to the webinar next. So the nurse to nurse resources to be very concrete as we move through this is we're primarily a peer support helpline. We have nurses who we train in this very robust curriculum. Um, they are professional peer counselors partnered with a clinician. And when you dial 844-687-7301, you are going to get that live nurse to offer you peer support. After your initial call, assessment is done, some engagement about whatever resources we can offer you, just venting and talking to another nurse is the most important thing. But that's primarily what we're offering. After that first call, we assign a nurse to you. And now she's going to call you every week or every day or every month or whenever you say so that we stay connected and it's an ongoing support. Um, we have online chat, chats, the webinars, virtual support, and we're going to be doing some events 
as well as creating a provider network. Because we think although we could make a referral, providers really don't understand what you're going through right now. So we really want to train them to cultural competence. Next. This is our webinar series. It's based on the six dimensions of resilience and positive psychology from UPenn. And you're going to hear from Michelle more about that. But self-awareness, um, self-regulation, mental agility, optimism, connection, and strength of character are the skills that we understand are needed to build our positive psychology and resilience. Next slide. So, I mean, again, terms that have been thrown around a lot and people are, you know, sort of Zoom too much and hear phrases too frequently. So we want to keep it real and fresh and genuine for you. But we are all tired. Our brains and bodies are tired. And we understand we're habituating anxiety um, as we go through this and, and trying to get used to becoming less anxious. And that's really how we keep referencing pandemic fatigue right now. Next. I think compassion, burnout, and moral injury. Compassion fatigue is what I just mentioned, sort of the result of working with individuals who are dealing with the consequences of trauma. Certainly all of you in your day-to-day -day work, pre, during, and certainly post-COVID. The burnout is sort of self-explanatory, emotional exhaustion and withdrawal because of increased workloads and institutional stress. But I think today we really want to highlight moral injury, which is defined as the impact one's ability to sense what's right and wrong. And this impact leads to a greater negative impact on your own psyche. So when you're sensing what's right and wrong and trying to resolve that, it can actually um, you know, have you experience some moral injury. Next. You know, what we understand about chronic challenges in COVID is that there's some very concrete data about moral injury, the influx of very ill patients, providers being pushed beyond their normal capabilities and typically available resources. Nurses are not able to provide the care that they were trained to provide um, during this time, treating more than the maximum number of patients per year. And there are high numbers of resignations. This is what we know about what's leading us to moral injury. Next. I think how moral injury turns to moral repair and resilience is why we're here. We want to acknowledge your experience, but rather than just highlighting the problems and the challenges, we want to talk about tools to move forward. So moral repair and resilience is our focus during this webinar. Moral repair and resilience is not overlooking the situation or trying to put a positive spin or minimize your experience. Um, it, you know, in the experience I had working with 9-11 rescuers, um, you know, we know that there are things that you experience that create a new normal, but do affect you for the long term and dramatically. And we need to acknowledge that. But in levels of moral resilience, as we try to move forward, we understand that there's micro sort of individual and habits, healthy habits, ways to take action in our habits that we can control if we can only control ourselves in this dynamic at the moment. And then there's sort of macro, which is the community. And what was so exciting for me being a peer support expert is that the nursing community has said that in the big picture, it is peer support and the way you're supporting each other that's getting you through the days on the units and in the places where you serve. So we think it's perfect timing for our peer support program. Next slide. When we think about post-traumatic stress and we talk so much about pandemic fatigue and moral injury and burnout, we have to also think about a term called post-traumatic growth. Um, again, this was something we used in other major disasters, 9-11, Katrina, now this pandemic, trying to understand why is it that, for example, in 9-11, two police officers in Port Authority ran into the same building about to collapse, and one came out and ended up becoming the chief and the other one died from alcoholism and depression. Why do, we, why do we have exposure to trauma and have different reactions? And what we understand is we're predisposed to the way we process trauma. If we have a strong sense of ourselves, if our relationships are intact and nurturing, and we have a belief in a higher power or spirituality or a religious belief, this research and research that's followed says that we don't only sort of survive the traumatic event, like what you're all going through during this pandemic, but we actually thrive if we feel as though 
we're using the skills and we're living the mission that we were called to do. If we were born a nurse and meant that, you know, knew that our service and our training was needed, now more than ever, do you see this trauma allowing you an opportunity to grow as a person? Next. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to my resilience expert, Michelle, who will talk to us about taking action in building our moral resilience, Michelle. Thanks, Sheree. So like Sheree had mentioned, post-traumatic growth is really the next step for us here. But how we get to that phase is through our own personal resilience. So what is resilience? Resilience is that ability to grow and thrive in the face of challenges and bounce back from adversity, right? So here we see we have mental, physical, social, and spiritual. These are the four pillars of resilience. What's important here is that we focus on each individual pillar and we build a foundation. And through that, we're not just going to be able to bounce back, but we're also going to be able to provide balance in our life. Next. So here we have the UPenn Positive Psychology Resiliency Skill Sets. UPenn Positive Psychology Center did a study on an abundance of human skill sets. And what they found is that these six are directly correlated to how resilient an individual is. So we have self-awareness, self-regulation, mental agility, strengths of character, connection, and optimism. And like Sheree had mentioned before, we're gonna be moving through each skill set over the next six months. So in the month of January, our skill set is self-awareness. And according to UPenn Positive Psychology Center, self-awareness is the ability to pay attention to your thoughts, your emotions, your behaviors, and your physiological reactions. Next. So self-awareness and our 2022 intentions. A lot of us use the new year as an opportunity to build those new year's resolutions or we hold new intentions. But I know most of us, I know myself included, by the end of January, beginning of February, we find that those things are a thing of the past, right? So how do we get ourselves to really live out these intentions by using self-awareness to foster our resilience? The first step is to know our core values. So we have a list of questions here. And what I invite you to do is to write down these questions. And I invite you to spend at least five minutes later on today. You can either silently reflect on them to yourself or you can use each question as a journal prompt. The key is to really carve out time to practice that self-awareness and to hone in on what our core values are. So the first question is what is important to you? You can think of the first three things that pop in your head or you can just list out all the things that come to mind. The next is what makes you feel inspired and motivated. So really think about the last time that you felt excited about something. Who were you with? What were you doing? Try to get as specific as possible when thinking about this question. And the last question, who do you admire most? When you find the answer to this question, really think about what is it exactly that you admire about them? And once we know our core values, we're then able to allow our values to then become our compass moving forward. Next. So again, back to the resiliency skill sets. If you're sitting here and you're really struggling to think and brainstorm of some of your core values or some of your intentions, I invite you to refer back to these skill sets. Re create an intention or try to find a value within each skill set. And again, get as specific as possible and always feel free to write them down. I always say there is a magic in putting pen to paper. Next. So again, like I had mentioned before, when the end of January rolls around, beginning of February, our intentions, our resolutions become a thing of the past. So how can we really turn this self-awareness of knowing our core values into action in order for us to live out our intentions? The most important question to ask ourselves is, are there any barriers that keep us from living out these intentions? Are there things that are getting in our way? Why aren't we living out these intentions? And the next part to this is setting ourselves up for success. So how can we set ourselves up for success? How can we eliminate any of these barriers that may be getting in our way? James Clear, he's the, he's the author of Atomic Habits. He has this concept of how we need to allow our intentions and our identity to align. His book really goes into the science behind how do we create new positive habits and how do we get rid of the old habits that don't serve us well anymore? What he found is in order to reach those big change moments, we have to shift our focus into those small daily habits we do each and every day. And we have to ask ourselves, do the habits that we're doing right now, does that align with our identity? Does that align with the person who we are, who we want to become? Next. 
So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna let the master do the talking. We're just gonna watch a short video of James Clear on how our habits form our identity. And even more so your, your identity and sense of self a lot of times is all rolled up into your habits, which is even a crazier kind of a messing with your brain in that these little things you do that you might ignore all the time could change who you actually are. So I, I had this question while I was researching the book. I think identity plays a crucial role, but my question was like, well, how do we come to believe things about ourselves? Because when you come into the world as a baby, you don't have any preset beliefs or notions. Um, that's not to say that, again, your genes don't matter. They certainly matter in some sense, like your, your height might be more or less baked into your DNA. Uh, but we all realize that if you grew up in a different culture or a different religion or a different uh, community or household, you could adopt completely different beliefs if that was what you're raised in. And so um, I was like, well, how does that happen, right? How, do, how does this internal story that we tell ourselves, our identity, become shaped and formed? And I realized that it's mostly through the repetition of that story. And uh, so what you come to realize is that your habits reinforce a particular identity. And sometimes this can be positive and sometimes it can be negative. The story could be things like, I'm bad at math or I'm terrible remembering people's names or I'm not good at direction, uh, remembering directions. Please. Yeah. And all of those stories, that's just an internal story that you tell yourself. But each time you have an experience that reinforces that, the story gets solidified. And so I think the method, the, the takeaway here is that every action you take is kind of like a vote for the type of person you want to become. And if you can master the right actions, if you can master the right habits, then you can start to cast votes for this new identity, this desired person that you want to be. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why small habits matter so much. They don't necessarily transform your life overnight, right? Right away, like doing one push up does not transform your body but it does cast a vote for being the type of person who doesn't miss workouts or meditating for one minute might not give you an immediate sense of calm in your life, but it does cast a vote for being a meditator. And this is why one of the things I say in the book, like the real goal is not to run a marathon. The goal is to become a runner. The goal is not to write a book. The goal is to become a writer because once you've adopted that identity, you're really not even pursuing behavior change anymore. You're just kind of acting in alignment with the type of person you already see yourself to be. It's kind of like true behavior change is really identity change because once you've changed that internal story, it's way easier to show up each day. You're not even really motivating yourself that much to do it. You're just like, this is who I am now. I love that video. I think that is a really, really core part about knowing our core values and how we take our self-awareness into action, right? Ask yourself, what is that identity we need to take on in order to make self-awareness a daily practice? And once we know that identity and we want to shift it into more action, our next step is habit stacking. Habit stacking is a concept that also comes from James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, and it's the key to making self-awareness a daily practice. The concept is taking a new habit and taking advantage of the old ones by pairing that new habit with an old habit. So the formula James Clear uses is before or after my current habit, I will then implement my new habit. So an example here I have is after I brush my teeth that night, I will journal, journal for five minutes, right? What we're doing is we're taking a habit that we do without much thought, like brushing our teeth, and we're pairing it with a habit that we want to do. So for example, this webinar is all about self-awareness. Journaling is a great self-awareness tool. And the key here is to really make it super simple. That way we can pair it with that old habit. Next. So what I want everyone to do now is either take a picture of the slide or write down the steps as we run through them, because we're going to be breaking out into smaller groups after this and running through these steps together. So step number one to habit stacking is, of course, listing out your current habits. That's the foundation of building a new habit, right? We can't have it stack if we don't know what are the habits we're already doing. So make a list of your five to 10 habits. This could be making your bed, brushing your teeth, drinking your coffee, whatever it is, really think about those things that you do without much thought and just simply make a list of all of them. Step two is brainstorming those new daily goals. What are those intentions? What is that identity you want to take on moving forward? What are those habits that you need to implement each and every day, right? And pick your top three that you want to focus on. And step three is foolproof your new habits. This is a really important part about habit stacking. We want to make our goals and our habits as attainable as 
possible. We want to make it so easy for ourselves that not doing it isn't an option. So really make it as small. If you think it's too small, it's probably the right goal for you, right? If reading before bed is a habit you want to implement, make it reading one sentence your daily goal. And then as you move forward, add on to a paragraph, to a page, 10 pages, and so on. The point is we want to start small and build off of that. And then step four is, of course, adding that new habit to an old one. So refer back to your list one and then refer to your list two and match a new habit to one of the old ones that you want to do. And number five is staying positive and consistent. It's so important to recognize that small steps lead to big change and staying positive and consistent through that process is so important. We want to make sure that we're celebrating our progress and not focusing too much on perfection during this time. Next. So at this time, I'm going to pass it back to Ravi. He's going to give us a few instructions, and we're going to break out into smaller groups. Okay, so we're going to break into three uh, breakout rooms, and you've all been assigned. So when I open up the rooms, I'm going to ask you to select join um, so you can share for five minutes, and then I will bring you back. In the event that you try and leave the breakout room, do not leave our meeting. That's something that happens. It's, it's one button, um, just you don't have to press. Press uh, leave breakout room in the event that you, you want to. And if you happen to, to leave the meeting by mistake, just join back and uh, we will get you back in. So I'm gonna open up the breakout rooms, just select join, it'll be five minutes and uh, we will see everyone soon. Okay, welcome back from the breakout rooms. What we're gonna do is since we had three different groups, we're gonna ask uh, for our leaders of each group um, to just offer a little summary and share uh, if there's any information that you wanted to share with the rest of us. So let's start with Michelle. Michelle, what did, you, uh, what did your group talk about? Yeah, at first, I just wanna shout out my group because everyone was very engaging and interactive and everyone had really great things to bring. So thank you to my group for that. But one theme that I was seeing is how hard it is to actually implement things, right? A lot of us are very zero to a hundred. We wanna make change, but that change means we have to change everything all at once. So habit stacking was really something that people were able to relate to and see as something that's doable, right? And even to reshifting that narrative in our head that as caregivers, we're always looking to help. Even in that time that we have to serve ourselves, we're always looking to help someone else. So really using those times of our habits to just give back to ourselves. And we talked about that concept of pockets of peace. How can we find those pockets of peace throughout our day to just recharge just enough to continue on? So thank you again, everyone in my group. It was, it was great. Yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely love the pockets of peace and mm -hmm. definitely uh, recharging is something that's so important. Um, 100%. Thank you all for sharing in Michelle's group. So let's go to Cherie. Cherie, uh, what did your group talk about? Yeah, I love my group too, Michelle. I know it always seems like we get exactly who we're supposed to get, but I shared an example about sort of adding a quick prayer after my coffee. And in our group, um, someone shared that they have that sort of habit stacking ritual, but if it's a little bit more robust and if it's a longer prayer, it doesn't always happen if there's interruptions. And I just love that open, honest, authentic dialogue because we do have this intention to sort of do this and then do that and deal with our self-care and then life happens, right? So we got to talk about that and what some of the adjustments were. And then someone else shared who works nights this beautiful little habit stacking ritual that she already has in place. She could have been the video for this, um, Michelle. So, you know, she does these three things that allow her to be able to sort of go to sleep during the day. And so there's already this habit stacking. So we just talked about sustaining it, but just such bright, interesting, you know, people to talk to. I love my group and love the feedback. Thank you, Shuri. I really appreciate that. Yeah, that sounds great. And I, I, I love the fact that we're pulling from the experience of other nurses, right? So you all are doing it and you're doing amazing things. And uh, we have nurses from throughout the entire state, from North, from South, from Central. So just hearing what other people are doing, it just, it's just one of the great things about this space that we have uh, for, for the nurses. Um, and let's finish up with Babs. Babs, let's share a little bit about your, your group. 
Well, I'm, I'm going to have to say I, I had an unbelievably fantastic group as well. I thought you <laughs> so, were going to say yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Give your groups a run for the money. Um, we were talking about uh, habits and how a lot of people, when you say habits, a lot of people automatically focus on bad habits. But we don't realize how many good habits that we already have in place. So the uh, stacking is kind of fun when you are sitting there picking out what good habit or what routine habit you have. And one of our, uh, one of the participants, they had mentioned that in the morning, they, the first thing they do, no matter what, is they always let their dogs out of the house. And thinking about that, she was thinking about, oh my God, wait, she has kind of an environmental change going on. She has nice fresh air. Wouldn't this be a great time to do her deep breathing, her five, seven, eight breathing? And, you know, she seemed really excited about it. And I love the idea. It's, um, she's changing the, her scenery by going outside. So she's kind of changing her mindset. And remember, this is something she already does. And then on top of it, she's implementing this breathing technique she knows for meditation to clear her head for her day. And then she's coming back in, not taking up any extra time in her day. This was already there. And now she's made it a positive, wonderful experience for herself, for self-care. Uh, and that was just fantastic. And uh, yes, so we, we, had, we did a great job in there. Thanks guys. That was really great. And I'd like to continue by telling you about uh, a nurse's heart story. Uh, I'm gonna read the definition here so we all are on the same page. A nurse's heart story is defined as a moment when you witnessed a nurse caring for another in a way that touched your heart. So I'm gonna get a little personal here by telling you my nurse's heart story. Uh, several years ago, I became a patient for the first time instead of being the nurse. I'm not sure how many of you have been in that situation before, but it is different. Um, I had a complicated spinal surgery where they had to go into my chest in order to reach the spine. Uh, as I was recovering in the ICU, I found myself in a position where I was so weak I could not speak, nor did I even have the strength to hit the call bell for the nurse. This was a feeling of vulnerability for me. Uh, and it was very foreign and a very scary mo moment for me. Laying in that bed, I was not able to communicate in any way to anybody what was going on inside me, in my heart, in my brain, physically. My family and friends were supportive and would hold my hand, kiss my forehead during my groans of discomfort, but I couldn't figure out a way for anyone to understand what my needs were. I felt helpless and I felt alone. The next nurse came on shift. She had gotten a report that I was weak and unfortunately that I was experiencing malignant hypothermia. Uh, believe you nurses know what that is, a reaction to anesthesia. Um, so I was very uncomfortable, couldn't talk, couldn't communicate. Interestingly, though, I wasn't thinking, will I die from this? What I was thinking was, please let me not be alone in this, no matter what the outcome may be. Retrospectively, I realized what I needed most at that moment. It was a connection with another human being. I needed someone to understand me. Although all the love and kisses were there and I value that support, it just wasn't the same as someone really understanding what was going on inside me. As the new nurse came into my room, I clearly remember the eye contact between us. I know that she was actively trying to find ways for us to communicate, but I remember that continuous, soft, almost tender, non-judgmental eye contact. I saw and experienced on the receiving end for the first time, the nurse's heart. I recognized it 
I felt it. I connected with it. And I felt understood. I was no longer alone in that very vulnerable moment. Believe it or not, it gave me a lifetime supply of hope that I would never be alone in any moment of my life because the power of human connection, to be understood, to be so delicately cared for by that nurse. Her power of compassion and caring, it's all beautiful and it's all the nurse's heart. I hope you guys don't mind that I shared that. I know that it's personal, but it's one of my most prized nurse's heart stories. And if I may, I have another one. And in a moment, I'm, we're gonna ask you to write a sentence or two in the chat of something you observed, a nurse's heart moment. Uh, working on the maternity unit, I was a new nurse and I observed something so beautiful. There was a baby born that was high risk because he was being weaned off narcotics. I watched for three months as my coworkers came into the nursery and would take turns spending time with this newborn, giving him the power of human touch, not just the feeding and the diapering, but they held this baby. They took him for walks in a stroller around the unit. They bought him cute little outfits. I watched them give this baby TLC 24 hours a day. This baby was thriving. This baby had what a human being deserves to have. This baby was held and loved by about 25 different nurses who cho chose to spend their break time, their own time going in and looking after this little guy. And the whole three months, it just touched my heart to see this, to see these nursing hearts in action. I think everyone here knows what I'm talking about. So if you wanna just pop into your uh, chat there, write a sentence or two about a time that you observed the nursing heart. And oh, I'm going to uh, read one here. My heart story was heard from son who on birth of his baby shared how the nurses were amazing during their difficult delivery of my new granddaughter. He shared how the nurses commanded the environment, embraced them and educated them. They took care of all of them. It's really amazing when you're an outsider and you get to watch nurses in action and you really get to feel what we do. That's uh, so beautiful. Yes, Sheree, yes. No, no, I was just gonna say, I'm so, you know, it seems like the laundry list of, uh, of what we can say about those moments goes on and on and, uh, Ravi's talking now about working as a clinician in psychiatric settings um, and the kindness um, that he witnessed. I, I had a, a baby in the NICU and was in the hospital for several weeks before delivering high risk, um, my son who's doing so great now. And we actually go back to the NICU and we haven't done it lately, but for years we would go back and thank the nurses around his birthday. Yep. Um, you know, so grateful. So it's so beautiful to, uh, to, oh, look, ba ba Babs, read this one. Look at this. Do you see from Maureen? My, yes, Maureen. Uh, my NP who truly listened to me and hugged me after the sudden death of my brother. Uh, incredible. Beautiful. So incredible. It sticks with you in your heart, right? Yeah. It really does. And, you know, because those moments are so effortless, in your selfless service, but you know we believe that just knowing that you're affecting change in people's lives and bringing these stories out and these connections out is a healing experience for both you, the nurses who are serving, as well as those of us who are on the other end of your kindness and your care is something really important to do. So you know people throw around the word heroes and 
want to make parades and do things and not that that's not all good, but it really is these moments um, that we want to highlight at nurse to nurse so that we can come together and sort of acknowledge this level of detail and, and kindness and sort of have our nurses heart story every week. Right, Barb is something yes. we can we can hold up to to really you know talk about how important the work is. So you know we mentioned what the the services are at Nurse to Nurse again. This peer support counseling over the phone, where someone's calling you every week or every few days and you're venting and you're making wellness goals or you're not or you're crying together or you're sharing lived experiences. This is really what we hope to do to help get you through this time and your lives and your wellness moving forward. Next slide, Ravi. I think what we've recognized in cop to cop and vet to vet and mom to mom and all these other programs is that although these webinars are powerful, that um, you know we need to stay connected to you. Um, it's nice to become educated and have a moment to reflect, but it's this ongoing help that is a continuum that people really need. So Ravi just put a form, a little thing you can click in the chat. But what it is, is it's a document that says we're allowed to call you. You're, you're pr pretty much giving us permission to pick up the phone and call you since you're so busy and it's so difficult for you to find time to call us. And if we can call you and follow up with you after this and just find out how your life is now and find out how we can help or what we can do, um, we find that that one-on-one -on -one private telephone call often leads us to a whole bunch of other stuff that we can do besides being in groups and webinars. So we're asking you to fill out this confidential form in the chat so that we can stay connected to you moving forward. Next. I think again, it's so important for us to stay connected nurse to nurse. Ravi, I'll turn it back to you as we wrap now. And yep. thank you. Absolutely, thanks Sheree. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, uh, on behalf of Nurse to Nurse and on, on behalf of Cherie and Babs and Michelle, really just wanted to say thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the fact that you, you heard about us. This is our first webinar. We want you to know that you could reach out to us anytime, fill out that forms, even if it's as a quick phone call, just to connect, just to share. You know, there's a few other stories that were shared in the chat. Uh, if you can scroll up and read them, it, they're just beautiful. And knowing that you were connecting with other nurses um, just really makes the world of a difference. You can call us um, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. Uh, again, our number is 844-687-7301. And remember, you're going to have a nurse answering the phone. Uh, it's going to be peer to peer. So again, lived experience, understanding, you know, um, everything that nurses go through, it really is such a unique uh, position, job, what you do, who you work with. It's just amazing, amazing work. Uh, we want you to um, go onto our website, uh, nurse to nurse nj.com, um, and you can go online and chat, email. Uh, that's where we're really going to be able to stay connected. Uh, this is our first webinar in January. Uh, we have, we want to be able to double the amount of people that, that, that joins us for next month. Um, as you can see on our schedule here, we have um, a webinar February through June. So let's see if we can, if each of you can get two of your colleagues, two nurses to join, um, even if you can't make it next month, but spread the word and get other people to, to, to come onto our website to register uh, for February's webinar. We'd love to just see you again and see other nurses um, really just get the experience of this. Um, so here's our schedule. Again, please reach out to us. Um, and yes, the Zoom link is going to be the same. Um, so if you register for February, we are gonna update the link. So hold on to this link and you, you can come on. The next, um, the next webinar is February 24th at 2 p.m. Same exact link that you're gonna be, that you use for today, self-regulation and work-life imbalance, right? Keyword there. We really gotta figure out a way to, to find more balance. I'm also putting in our chat um, a, an anonymous survey. Um, we, we have six webinars that are scheduled. Um, we wanna hear from you if there are ways that we can improve this for the next, um, next month. We wanna hear from your 
from your feedback from the survey and we will uh, we will make it better. Absolutely. And I did see um, this is um, being recorded. We're going to upload it to our nurse to nurse um, website for all the nurses that are currently in shift report or working or, you know, likely sleeping because they're working tonight. Uh, we we want to be able to, to reach out to as many nurses as possible. And again, um, this is a program for nurses. So please spread the word, um, you know, reach out to us. We can send you flyers. We can send an email blast <clears throat> to your nursing um, supervisor, whoever it is, your colleagues, your peers, throw it up in the break room. We're also on Twitter um, and we've been doing our best to spread the word. So this is a great start um, and we really wanna make it uh, better and better. Uh, so- May I real quick, Ravi? Yeah. Uh, I also think it's a great idea to uh, keep this phone number in your phone because you never know when you're at work, if you're on the, on the unit, and you notice your coworker that might need uh, someone to talk to, um, and it would be great just to have it right there for them. Maybe they could slip out and even talk to us on the phone for ten minutes, and you know, just just to help them out a bit, help all of our nurses. That's why we're here. Hey, thanks so much, Babs. We appreciate that. Yeah, a, a simple phone call on the way um, on the way home from work, on the way to your shift, whatever it is. If you happen to be mandated to work a double and you need to just, you know, pop out for five minutes and vent, whatever it is, you know, our nurses are there to support other nurses. Uh, it's confidential and we'll definitely be able to understand. Uh, we are gonna do our best to upload the video this week. So you can check back probably uh, the middle towards the end of the week um, and you'll see January's um, uh, webinar. Um, but with that said, again, Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, be safe. Uh, we know that hopefully the weather is going to be a little bit better the rest of the week, but hopefully some of you didn't get mandated this weekend to work a double, right? Because there was so much snow. Uh, thank you for all that you do. Remember to call us anytime. Um, and on behalf of the nurse and nurse team, we will see you next month. So take care. Thank you.